When you look at many different fields of biological evolution, you so often read this phrase, we were surprised, we were not expecting this result. Intelligent design has great heuristic value in exploring functions of junk DNA, which has been a topic of uh, a lot of research in recent years. Science has this structure of being indirectly inferential. We infer the unobservable to explain the observable. The pressure of the society is to think, well, things just are. But the whole world is to be enjoyed, not only its beauty, but its ugliness. Okay, so this is our ending uh, session We're with uh, four of our speakers representing uh, different disciplines from engineering to biology to philosophy of science and uh, theology and, and also math. Uh, and so I think they should be able to tackle anything you, you ask with them. But uh, we, I'll try to get to as many uh, questions as possible and also try to reflect the diversity of the questions that we're, we're getting. I apologize beforehand if we don't um, get uh, one that uh, you have. And uh, since we have about a half hour, a little more than that, the more expeditious you can be in answering, the more of the questions from people that we can get to. I'm gonna start with a question for Dr. Poitras. I have a question directly for him. Um, did numbers exist before creation? <laughs> yes, three and one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, let's, well, this is an interesting one. We have lots of different things. So in his book, uh, The Lost World of Genesis 1, uh, Walton wrote, uh, John Walton wrote, uh, ID does not contribute, so intelligent design does not contribute to the advance of scientific understanding. It's not testable or fa falsifiable. Comments. Steve, you want to start? Yeah. Oh, you have, you need oh, to, you, there's a mic. Hello, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm still a little jet lagged, so uh, yeah, yeah. some of my answers could be out there. But, um, well, this is an old saw, these, the use of these so-called demarcation arguments to decide what constitutes or does not constitute science. Um, I've shown in Signature in the Cell, for example, and in the, uh, my subsequent books that there are different ways of testing scientific theories depending on what type of scientific method you're using. And in the case of historical sciences, which are concerned to reconstruct uh, the, the past and to infer past causes of past events, the method that's used is called the method of inference to the best explanation. And <clears throat> the um, uh, hypotheses of that sort can be tested by comparing the explanatory power of competing hypotheses and by comparing the, uh, the, um, the hypothesis in question against our knowledge of cause and effect. Uh, and um, in both those ways, uh, the theory of intelligent design can be tested in, in just as a, a Darwinian or chemical evolutionary theory can be tested. So what, what, what was this other, it was not, it's not, not testable and not something and, and else. And not falsifiable. Not and, falsifiable. And hasn't aided the advance yeah. of science. Or well, and, and falsification is a, is a particular type of, of testing that um, is uh, allegedly always applies to true scientific theories that are taking place in the laboratory. But even there, falsification among philosophers of science has fallen into disrepute as a uh, a, definitional, a definitional criterion of science, it's very easy. For, uh, there, there are many, first of all, there are many, many examples of scientific theories that eluded falsification. It's very easy to um, elude falsification if you make a prediction that doesn't come true based on a given theory. You can say, well, it's the theory that was at fault, but it might be that the wind was blowing and the sun was in your eyes and that there was uh, some interfering condition that you didn't take into account. And so the history of science is, is fraught with examples of what are called auxiliary hypotheses that are formulated in order to save the initial hypothesis to explain why the prediction that you made didn't come true. So the first thing to note about falsification is it's really only relevant for 
scientific theories that are making predictions rather than, for example, historical scientific theories. They're attempting to explain what happened in the past after the fact. Those sorts of theories, the historical theories are retrodicting. So this is a, a, a debate, um, th 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 this is a, a rhetorical strategy claiming that some other theory isn't science in accord with some abstract definition that's, that's typically employed when you want to discredit something without actually addressing the evidential merits of the theory. And they attempt to define science normatively by reference to these so-called demarcation criteria has utterly failed within the philosophy of science. Philosophers of science think it doesn't work. And, um, and what I've shown in my work, uh, the one contribution I've made to that discussion is to show that, that to the extent that it works to disqualify one theory in a debate, for example, intelligent design, it would equally well disqualify the competing theory of Darwinism. So I call that the methodological equivalence of design and dissent. Just one quick final example, the, you hear this a lot, that, that to be scientific, you must invoke only observable entities. But um, neo-Darwinism as a theory postulates unobservable past transitional forms and unobservable past mutational events. Um, and in fact, theoretical physics and geology and many, many fields posit unobservable entities which, if true, real, or actual, would help explain things we do see. So science has this structure of being indirectly inferential. We infer the unobservable to explain the observable. And if that's a legitimate move within science, and it is because it's used all the time, then it's equally legitimate if you're inferring an unobservable designing intelligence. In other words, these, these abstract criteria don't work to discriminate the scientific status of the theory of intelligent design and its competitors. Okay. So in reading through the avalanche of questions, which are great, I think I've discerned three sort of main categories. Some are on the sufficiency of current naturalistic scenarios uh, and, and changes that are happening there. And then some are specifically on the implications of intelligent design. And then there are explicitly faith and theological questions. So I'm going to try to uh, get questions from each of those categories. I think maybe we'll start on the, the evolutionary science stuff and then we'll go to the, uh, the implications of ID and then we'll go to the faith, uh, more theological ones. Uh, but anyone can chime in. So on, on the sort of the naturalistic science, someone asked thoughts, does anyone have thoughts on the extended evolutionary synthesis? Is that a step in the right direction? So you might explain what it is and say whether you think it's a step in the right direction or not. Is Paul here? Uh, no. Oh. Paul Nelson, by the way, I, say, I know he was on the program, but uh, it happens to be his wedding anniversary today. Ooh, okay. So he is honoring his wife by trying to fly back in time to celebrate that, but we were glad that he was able to be with us. He's un unextending his visit yes. with us. Yeah. And, yeah. and so joining us, actually, I should say that many of you know him because you went to one of the uh, other the concurrent sessions, but we have biologist Jonathan McClatchy from Sattler College in uh, Boston, so. I'll let Jonathan take a rip at this too, but um, I wrote extensively about this in the book, uh, Darwin's Doubt. The extended synthesis is a step in the right direction insofar as it is explicitly acknowledging that the mutation natural selection mechanism that is the staple of Darwinian explanatory strategies is inadequate, that the mutation selection mechanism lacks creative power, and therefore the extended synthesis is uh, uh, um, the attempt to find other mechanisms that can supplement or complement or uh, compensate for that lack of, of, of creative power. Some of you may know about the conference that was held at the Royal Society in London in 2016. It was convened by a number of scientists who would be sympathetic to the idea of the need for an extended synthesis. The conference was convened to uh, explore um, other mechanisms that might provide the creative power that mutation selection doesn't. The conference opened with a talk by a man named Gerd Muller, a prominent Austrian evolutionary biologist who enumerated the, what he called the explanatory deficits of the neo-Darwinian mechanism. Uh, the problem with the extended synthesis is that the mechanisms that have been proposed in support of it are equally lacking in the creative power, especially with respect to 
morphological innovation, large scale changes in form in the history of life. And in Darwin's Doubt, if you're curious, I've got two chapters on post-neo-Darwinian theories of evolution, many of which would be considered to be part of that extended synthesis. And you can look as to why many of those fail as well. Okay. I was at the 2016 London conference as well of the Royal Society. And I think that we would all agree that the processes they discussed there are real biological processes. What was sorely lacking in the presentations was a demonstration that these actually possess sufficient explanatory power to account for the things that, natu that Dar the classic neo-Darwinian synthesis fails to explain, right? So that, that was uh, disappointing. I mean, so e evolution of developmental biology is uh, one uh, major aspect of the extended evolutionary synthesis. EVO-DEVO stands for evolution of developmental biology and it's all the rage at the moment in the evolutionary biology community. And one, one issue with the idea that you can basically explain large-scale changes by these developmental changes to uh, these um, Hox genes which are expressed during development is that the, the Hox genes or the homeobox genes are actually expressed after the body plans of the organism has actually already been established. And so they're not expressed er sufficiently early to actually be relevant to the, the body plan uh, of the organism. So that's a key deficit. Yeah, to large-scale changes in form, right. exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, we had another question about whether you could point, any of you could point to some top recent books or I'd add articles that constitute examples of the crumbling of neo-Darwinism within the mainstream scientific establishment. You talked about the Royal Society Conference, but this person was wondering, or do, either, do any of you have references to some recent books and uh, papers that would signify how the mainstream you know, neo-Darwinism is yeah, there, there's scads of them cited in, in Darwin's Doubt, and um, there are many, many, each of the representatives of these different new schools of thought, natural genetic engineering, James Shapiro, the Evo Devo people, the people um, formed of Stuart Kaufman and his ideas about, about um, self-organization, um, neo-Lamarckian epigenetic inheritance, you know, each one of these new ideas has a proponent, and the proponents only have taken time to publicly develop these alternatives because they commonly also critiqued neo-Darwinism as uh, an, an inadequate uh, framework for understanding the origin of, again, major morphological innovation. And one of the speakers at the Royal Society quipped that not neo-Darwinism, but criticism of neo-Darwinism was, sound, was now so early 90s. It, it was passe even to criticize the theory. We all know it doesn't work. Can we stop beating that dead horse? So it, it's really hard. Sometimes it's really hard when we're just reading the textbooks or the pronouncements of the AAAS or, or uh, the National Academy of Sciences or the National Center for Science Education to believe that, that it really is the case that leading evolutionary biologists have grown uh, seriously disaffected with the mainstream theory. But it's true, and, and the mainstream theory really isn't in, mainst in mainstream anymore. That's just okay. what you see in the literature. Stuart? <clears throat> yeah, just to make a brief uh, additional point, uh, Paul Nelson gave a very good talk this morning on orphan genes. One of the, the interesting observations he made is he, he had all these quotations from recent research, and amongst the texts, you often see this phrase, we were surprised, this was not what we were expecting. And when you look at many um, different fields of biological ev evolution, you so often read this phrase, we were surprised, we were not expecting this result. So you do see that doubt if you just look at the language and the way these papers are written. So that, that's not referring to a whole book or a whole paper, but just the language that permeates the literature shows the problems that, that they are uh, um, accounting. If I could piggyback on that, it, that also shows the resistance of neo-Darwinism or people operating within even the, the extended synthesis framework or whatever evolutionary framework they choose, the, it, the resistance to those evolutionary, of those evolutionary frameworks to falsification by unexpected or unpredicted results. Okay. That's mm -hmm. typically the way we, we want to, to evaluate things. Are the 
empirical data expected given a theory or given a, a hypothesis, and when you have that kind of repeated expression of surprise, it's, it it's, uh, uh, ought to alert folks that maybe they're, they're, not, they're not on the right track, but they keep creating auxiliary hypotheses to try to save the original. Okay, so two more science questions, then we're gonna move on to sort of some broader questions about intelligent design, and then we're gonna move on to some more really faith-specific things. Uh, but these are to particular people. So the first is to Dr. Burgess. If we add tendons, muscle, blood equivalent to a robot ankle, can the result match human ankle flexion pronation strength? I hope you understand that question, because I don't. <laughs> yeah, thank you uh, for the question. This morning I focused mainly on the bone architecture of the joints. I just had time to do that. At the end, I did say, in actual fact, you have this incredible integration of tendons and ligaments, blood vessels, nerves, and, and, in, and it's incredible how compact our joints are, all that functionality in a small space. Now, I have designed robots, and we have tried to integrate uh, a lot of those things into a small space, and you cannot get you know, remotely close to what happens in a human joint. And if you look at any prosthetics, um, there have been some recent review papers on prosthetics, and they struggle to get much functionality into prosthetic wrist joints, prosthetic ankle joints. Uh, they are so crude compared to what happens in the human body. And one of the biggest challenges is packing a lot of functions into a small space. Engineering systems are, are so bulky compared to human biological systems. So it's very instructive and revealing when you make that comparison between the best of engineering and biology. And a lot of investment goes into medical engineering, you know, millions of dollars, and yet they cannot get close to human performance. Great. And so of course, you also have to deal with the fact that there can be healing in a living foot, and, and it is generated from a baby. Uh, those things are in addition to everything you talked about. Yeah, exactly, and uh, yeah, really mind-boggling, and just the whole assembly, growing an assembly, rather than having engineers assemble things, it, it's, it's just, uh, it, it's really mind-boggling. Uh, there's that verse in the Bible, I think, Ecclesiastes, as you do not know how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the thoughts of God who made everything. Mm. Yeah. That point about self-healing, that's uh, really um, also kind of an intelligent really design special verse, because isn't it? Yes. Alfred Russell Wallace, who co-developed the theory of natural selection, evolution by natural selection, but later in life actually became a proponent of really guided form of evolution, very much an intelligent design friendly view. Um, one of the things that he cited that was so amazed him about the human body and and nature to begin with was the properties of self-healing, of self-repair, that you have organisms that actually have properties that can repair damage. Um, okay, with that, one more science question that we're gonna go on. This is, I think, directed primarily to, to Steve Meyer, but could, uh, anyone else could join in. Does the RNA world have any more explanatory power scope in explaining the origin of information now than it did when you wrote Signature in the Cell? Oh, thank you. That's a hobby horse of mine. Um, <laughs> You, it, some folks may know that uh, my new book reprised some of the arguments from Signature in the Cell um, in the section on the origin of life, including the critique of the RNA world. Um, somehow, however, Daryl Falk uh, of uh, Biologos uh, claimed that there have been great advances in RNA world, of which I was unaware in the new book, and therefore the critique that I'd offered before was no longer valid. Oddly, however, on, uh, uh, he, he then cited uh, some experiments by um, uh, Gerald Joyce and uh, claiming that the, well, here, background, I had, I had argued that the, to get an RNA self-replicator, which is the kind of holy grail of RNA research, that you would get an RNA molecule that can copy itself such that then some form of natural selection could get going is the, is the thing that is envisioned in the RNA world scenario. I had argued in Signature in the Cell and then repeated that same uh, claim in the new book that 
the best RNA world researchers had been able to do was to get an RNA molecule that could copy just 10% of itself, and only then if they specifically sequenced the, the nucleotide bases on the RNA molecule. In other words, only if they provided very specific information, but they hadn't been able to get a molecule to copy the whole of itself, only a small amount, and that information, and the informative nature of that molecule was itself a product of intelligent design. Uh, Falk said, no, no, that's not true. There's been great advances. And then he cited work by Gerald Joyce that I had um, already uh, critiqued in the new book and in the previous books and said that I was unaware of this. It was on page 309. Check it. It's in the book. And the, the backstory on it is even more appalling because what, the, Gerald, what, what the, the Joyce experiments do is they take two pre-synthesized chunks of RNA and then they have another pre-synthesized long strand of RNA, which is complementary. The, two, the, two, the pre-synthesized pieces have all but one linkage, and then the long pre-synthesized RNA enzyme um, accomplishes what's, what, what's called ligation. It, it connects at that one point. And they said, so look, and, and then, they, then they introduce enzyme proteins from existing cells to help cause that whole complex to copy itself. And th this is really strange and bizarre at multiple levels because Joyce and Orgel, or Joyce, not Orgel in this case, but just Joyce and, and other colleagues um, intentionally designed the two halves that were linked together. They intentionally designed the long uh, RNA enzyme that did the joining, um, but they didn't create anything that did what's called polymerization, which is taking freestanding RNA bases and, cr and causing them to link up, and then that whole chain to copy itself. That's what would have to happen in a prebiotic environment. And they're also introducing um, enzymes from already existing cells. So they're trying to simulate the origin of the first life from non-living uh, non materials, non-living chemicals, but to simulate that, they have to use enzymes from already living cells. So there was intelligent design, there was just multiple layers of, of cheating. And I, I explained this not only in the first book, but in a long exchange in the Times Literary Supplement in uh, the UK after my book had been uh, reviewed there. And then also again in the new book, and somehow Professor Falk uh, said that I was unaware of these great advances that had taken place, which aren't advances, that it's, that this is nothing but intelligent design of a, of a cross-catalyzing uh, our, our RNA system, but it, it, it was n nothing like self-replication. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to shift over to, to about three specific questions on intelligent design, then I hope to get to three or four uh, more on some theological and philosophical topics. So on the questions on intelligent design, we had a question, how do you think belief in ID might affect our approach to environmental conservation? Don't all uh, jump at once. We're for it. We, <laughs> I mean, my, let me let me prod a little more. I, I, I didn't write the question, but wouldn't it seem to me that if you have a view that nature is designed, that that would be um, a reason that you should treat it with uh, respect and also be careful of messing up uh, ecosystems and other things because it may be finely tuned to do certain things. And you can certainly see a history of putting invasive species, doing all sorts of stuff, of mucking stuff up because we have the hubris of thinking, oh, we perfectly understand that, we'll just do that, and then it turns out to have unintended consequences. The, the design includes interaction of species and various dependencies on the environment. So it's the whole show. <laughs> okay, so a more um, philosophical design question. Materialists have difficulties explaining the rather obvious design in nature. How do proponents of ID, however, generally account for what appears to be random in nature? What do you, uh, I, I asked the question or what they mean by what appears to be random in nature. Uh, I, mean, ser I mean, one talking point that sometimes comes up on social media threads, like if you ever go on Twitter, <laughs> this is something that I, I've encountered where people will say, they think this is, a, this is a gotcha question. Is there anything that's not designed? Um, and so the, the uh, objector is thinking that one is presenting um, a more ill-conceived argument for design. Uh, you've heard some people, uh, for example, say, well, painters require 
a painter, paintings require a painter, creation therefore requires a creator. And of course the problem with that argument is that we're begging the question because the whole debate is whether we're actually living in a, in a creator, in, in a creation. And for, to, for us to recognize design in the world, there has to be a point of contrast, right? So it's very difficult to recognize a painting unless you have a point of contrast for what's not a painting. And so that's where the objection, what the objection is getting at. And my response to that question is always, of course there are things in the world that are not designed. I don't believe the Grand Canyon is designed, for example. I don't think God came down and chiseled out the Grand Canyon. No, I think that that's uh, the product of erosion over a, over a long period of time. It was carved by the, the Colorado River and so forth. So, yeah, we've recognized design by contrasting it with, with what's not designed or what appears to be random. Uh, just a very brief point. I think one of the really helpful things coming out of uh, Discovery People was the concept of specified complexity. It's, it's good to differentiate between complexity and specified complexity uh, that, that you find in DNA and biological systems. Could, okay. I, could I take a run at this? This is a really, sure, actually sure. a very deep sure. and important question. Um, I like what Jonathan just uh, contributed as well. Um, in theology, back to medieval theology, there's a distinction between the ordinary power of God and the, and the fiat power of God, potentia ordinata versus potentia absoluta, the idea that the God, the divine action manifests itself in different ways. And I think a, 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 a biblical view of, uh, a, a biblical view of divine action or theology of nature implies that God is doing at least two things. He's sustaining the universe by the word of his power, as it says in Hebrews, but he also acts discreetly as an agent within the matrix of time and space and history in a way that is discernible to, to us. And, um, and so uh, Jack Collins, the um, uh, theologian at, at Covenant Seminary, has written an interesting little book called The God of Miracles. And um, he, he explains that, that, that he thinks it is quite biblical to think of natural things having having uh, power, ha having causal powers, that there are what theologians long have called secondary, uh, secondary causes as well as primary causes. So in detecting, when, when we detect design in specified complexity, we're detecting discrete actions of a creator as opposed to the ongoing regularities that God may in fact be sustaining or upholding, as many uh, uh, Jews and Christians believe, but in a way that is, is not discernible. We, we can't discern his handiwork in the same way as we can when we see an artifact that manifests information content or a sculpture or something like that. So um, uh, I, I think there's some deep in issues of, of the, in the theology of nature that have to be teased out to answer that fully, but I think there's, a good, there's good answers okay. to it. I'm gonna move, oh, uh, well, uh, Stephen is helpful in making the distinction between secondary and primary cause. And God is the primary cause of everything. But in the ordinary course of nature, he's, he's uh, sustaining secondary causes. And with the Grand Canyon, you have a good opportunity of explaining a whole lot in terms of secondary causes and the uh, flow of water and erosion and so on. But I don't want to give up with the fact that the Grand Canyon is beautiful. And that reflects the beauty of God. But that's an indirect thing in terms of God is using means in that case and is, is not uh, a quite parallel to the painter uh, where you see his direct hand at every point. Yeah, and Jonathan's right. We detect design against the backdrop of what nature ordinarily does without the direct assist of an intelligent agent. And that's what, that is what makes it work. That's what makes the design inference work. And that's a completely valid way to reason, even if we want to think that God is involved in what we call secondary causes, which I do think, but that's the other power of God. God may manifest his power in, in the world in more than one way. So um, we have about four minutes left and tons of questions. I'm gonna extend, we're gonna go a little over because I wanna to get to some more of these. I wanna ease in to something that goes from design but also raises some theological issues and then we'll get to some more of that and then end up with the final question. Um, what, when we see the astounding complexity and apparent design of pathological mechanisms, how should we react? 
So the problem natural evil. Yeah. Uh, it's a real challenge and difficulty. Um, the trouble is, the challenge is that this is a fallen world. Uh, the the uh, heart of the fall is in human rebellion against God with Adam and Eve. The effects of the fall, however, though they're most devastating on us <laughs> and, and in our hearts, they do extend outward. It talks about the curse of the ground and so on. The Bible doesn't elaborate on just how extensive those effects are. So, so the pathologies are part of a fallen world. I, I certainly think that uh, this is a difficult question, and I think that we should acknowledge it as a difficult question, because I think it undermines our credibility if we don't say it's a difficult question. Um, and uh, I don't have a fully um, worked out answer that has completely satisfied me on this. There are a number of helpful ideas. Um, I, I, I think it's plausible that at least some uh, apparently malevolent designs were originally good designs uh, that for, for good purposes. So for example, there's one theory that viruses originally emerged as a mechanism of moving genes between cells, which is a possible, which, which is a possible view. Um, and uh, it's, uh, I, I, I'm intrigued by the idea of William Dembski in his book, The End of Christianity, about proposing that there's a retroactive cause and effect relationship uh, with respect to the fall, um, affecting not only these those things on this side of the fall, but also things before in the pre-fall world. So he would argue that um, that at the Garden of Eden there are two worlds that intersect. Uh, there's the world, the perfect world, the idealized world of the Garden of Eden, which is presented to us as a local regional garden uh, into which Adam is placed. And then there's the external outside world that God has prepared in advance of the fall. And then when Adam and Eve rebel against God, they're expelled from the Garden of Eden. Uh, into that world, as that's one possible view. Another view that's been floated is that uh, that uh, animal death and so forth is, is correlated in some way to the fall of Satan, because we understand that we're, there was sin in the world even before Adam and Eve. And so, yeah, I, I think it's a difficult issue, but there are certainly some ideas. There's two people in the ID movement that are doing some really interesting work on this. One is Scott Minnick, uh, the, the microbiologist, and the other is Don Ewart, who's a virologist um, and uh, immunologist. Um, here's something just to think about that's, I think, really suggestive and very interesting is that virulence uh, capability in bacteria and, and to a lesser degree in viruses as well as I understand it, but it's certainly in bacteria, is a consequence of loss of genetic information. So uh, I heard a fascinating talk that Minnick gave uh, where he basically did a natural history of the plague bacterium and showed that the original bacterium from which the plague had descended um, was completely harmless to humans. In fact, we had a pre-programmed immunological response to the bacterium. But as it gradually lost information, it became progressively more and more, uh, uh, lost information by mutation, it became progressively more and more virulent. And there were four successive mutations that could be actually tra be tracked in natural history. And so it's really interesting because the, there's an inversion here. Neo-Darwinism wants to attribute creative power to mutations that are then selected by the mechanism of selection. But in fact, it may be the case that mutations are degrading in pre-existing information. And if they degrade it far enough, they can alter uh, original forms of design that were harmless or beneficial and turn them into, in the case of the plague, the, the greatest killer in human history. And so I think there's something really interesting there. I, I have a long uh, footnote about this at the end of chapter 14, suggesting that this is a way of addressing the problem of natural evil, to, to tease apart the distinction between aboriginal design and, the, this, and, and subsequent decay. And if we take the biblical, I, I think, uh, biblical ID theorists, as opposed to just generic ID theorists, have some explanatory resources to draw on in addressing these kinds of questions, because in Romans we not only have the idea that, the, that uh, God has made his, his attributes and existence known from the things that are made, but we also have the idea that creation is groaning for its redemption and that it's, um, it's, in, it's in a kind of bondage to decay is the, is the actual words. And so there's a sense that if you're a, 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 a biblical ID theorist, you should accept to see evidence of both 
original good design and subsequent decays, uh, decay of that design. And at the molecular level or at the cellular level, the microbiological level, that's exactly what we're seeing. And so I, I think there's a match of expectations there that is confirmatory of a biblical perspective, although the Bible is somewhat mute in telling us the whole of the backstory about how the fall affected both man and nature. Okay. Yeah, and cancer uh, is, many forms of cancer uh, mute, mutations of good things uh, in the cell. Regulatory systems that get left on when there was supposed to be re regulation to shut them off, and yeah, exactly. Okay, two, two more questions. One, I think probably Dr. Poitras is the best suited to answer this question, but anyone else could go in. Someone asked, do any of the panelists know what interpretation of Genesis 1 was most widely held by the early church? Well, if we're talking about the first centuries, then uh, there's some variation. Augustine believed in instantaneous creation. The predominance was just talking about six days, but really that's straight out of Genesis, but it doesn't answer the question of, well, what kind of days? So I think some of the discussion is vaguer than what we're now expecting in terms of diverse theories. Okay. Yeah, if you want a survey of the theories, then my own book, Redeeming Science, I give you 10, 10 different theories, but those are modern variations. Okay. So then I think this might be a good question on which to, to end uh, because the topic this year was design and designer. And so the idea of design in nature was the key thing. This person asked, considering that there are many facets to intelligent design, ranging from universal fine tuning to molecular information, um, what, and I'd say language and other things, I mean, just all the things discussed in this conference, what areas are currently the most ripe for further investigation, expansion, research? Why don't we, why don't we can, uh, start Stuart with Stuart? Stuart should tell us a bit more about biomimetics. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, I th we've heard already from the other speakers about information genetics. I think information is really, really um, key. Just, but then speaking from my own um, area, biomimetics has a lot of potential because we hear from Nathan Lentz, as I was explaining, and other authors that evolution predicts bad design, there's bad design everywhere. But there's this contradiction that we have a world of engineers who see nature as the gold standard of design and they're investing in bio biomimetics, assuming, and often there is this assumption that nature has the best solution. And companies, what they're interested in is profit. They're, they're, they're not interested in you know, what's the, the theology behind this. And so investors are investing huge sums of money. So biomimetics is, I think, very relevant to the whole debate because you see this contradiction between how engineers view design in nature and how people like Nathan Lentz and Richard Dawkins, they're just hoping, they're actually hoping that there's bad design and assuming there's bad design, not facing up to uh, the reality. So I, I, that's just relating to my own area, but I'm sure the other people will speak about information. Yeah, I mean, I put in a word for the ordinary person of just recovering a, a sense, this is my father's world, because the pressure of the society is to think, well, things just are. That's one reason why I referred to the beauty of Grand Canyon. Of, so I don't want those things to go, but for us, or the, the beauty of of a mountain range, right? That's not a living thing. It's not, doesn't have uh, information input in the same way as the cell, but, but the whole world is to be enjoyed. And also it's not only its beauty, but its ugliness, right? The, the, this issue of the fall and the ugliness of human behavior and so on. We, all of that is a challenge, I think, for people who've been reconciled to God and listen to the Bible, open your eyes, right? Begin to see the world through the spectacles of scripture rather than the spectacles of philosophical materialism, which is around us. 
Yeah, and in terms of uh, fruitful reasons, uh, fr fruitful directions for uh, intelligent design research, I, I, I certainly agree with Stuart Burgess that biomimetics is a really great avenue that brings uh, engineering and biology together. Of course, intelligent design is an engineering field, uh, recognizing the patterns associated with engineering. Um, I think also uh, um, intelligent design has great heuristic value in exploring uh, functions of junk DNA, which has been a topic of uh, a lot of research in recent years, um, and which was once thought to be non-functional, and then as, as science progresses and advances, more and more of that dark matter of the genome, as it were, it turns out to be not so dark after all. Um, also, sub uh, apparently suboptimal design that's often alleged, uh, such as the, and then a lot of these systems that were once thought to be uh, suboptimally designed have turned out, uh, as science has advanced, to not be so suboptimally designed after all. Uh, the inverse wiring of the vertebrate retina would be one case in point. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think that these, uh, the intelligent design has heuristic value from that perspective. Yeah, I'm extremely excited about this, actually. Uh, uh, Casey Luskin and Brian Miller, our, our research coordinators, were supporting research in a variety of different subdisciplines sub of biology and beyond. Uh, one area that's particularly fruitful is the area of bioinformatics and the, looking for certain types of design patterns in the informational, cap or the in, 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 informational attributes, so uh, looking for function in junk DNA. The, the orphan gene project that Paul Nelson talked about today is extremely exciting and going to be really fruitful. Uh, there's a, a research project we've supported searching for what are called overlapping genes, where you have a genetic message layered on top of another genetic message layered on top of another ge genetic message and in one, one reading frame and then three messages in the reverse reading frame as well. This has been, uh, I'm alluding to discoveries that have been made by some ID researchers showing that, that uh, information is, there's, there's nested coding of information, sophisticated cryptographic techniques for um, storing and encrypting information are present in cells. This is just an absolutely fascinating thing. Um, we have a huge project on what's called the waiting times, which is, an, uh, an attempt to mathematically evaluate the plausibility of neo-Darwinism uh, in accord with its own mathematical framework of population genetics. And we've got a great team working on that with uh, Ola Husra, Gunter Beckley, Rick Sternberg, and Gager, showing that, that, that uh, even according to what you'd expect, uh, well, according to what you'd expect from uh, the neo-Darwinian mathematics of population genetics, there's not nearly enough time to build even a few very simple traits, let alone the whole complexity of new animal forms that arise at particular points in the fossil record. And that's a way of mathematically testing and evaluating the plausibility of some of those theories. So there's, there's just a wealth of, and there's a lot of stuff on the fine tuning that's, go, that's going on. And um, so there's just a lot of research happening right now that's super exciting. <laughs>